Okay. Okay. Um, just move my screens around here. All right. Uh, so um, good evening and um, welcome to the last panel of the annual meeting of the American Society of Comparative Law. Uh, my name is Tim Webster. I'm a uh, associate professor of law at Western New England University. And I'm really excited to welcome all of you to what I know is going to be a terrific and stimulating panel on World War II at 75, litigation, history, and memory. Um, I'm gonna introduce each of the panelists before he or she speaks. And so what I'm gonna do right now is just uh, lay out what I think are some of the important themes that we'll be talking about. Um, what many people don't know, although the people on this panel are, are surely aware, uh, World War II may have ended 75 years ago, but the efforts to redress some of the grave harms that were suffered and inflicted upon civilians during the war continue uh, up until the present moment right now on October 16th, 2020. Um, attempts to allocate liability and to seek redress have been underway for most of the post-war period. Uh, the issue of war operations took on additional steam um, or sort of internationalized during the 1990s. Uh, in the United States, lawyers repurposed the alien tort statute to bring a, a range of lawsuits in New York and New Jersey, cases involving forced labor, cases involving seized Swiss bank accounts, uh, cases involving the restoration of artworks, and uh, both Professor Nelson and Professor Basler will address this in more detail in their remarks. Uh, meanwhile, in Europe, uh, forced laborers also filed lawsuits in Germany and in Italy. Uh, one of those lawsuits made it all the way up to the International Court of Justice, the Jurisdictional Immunities Decision uh, in 2012. Um, and as part of that decision where Italian courts ordered the German government to pay compensation to forced laborers, Italian forced laborers, um, there was a case appended to that involving a, a series of Greek lawsuits that had wended its way up through the Greek courts. Um, also, uh, this is involving a massacre that the German army perpetuated in 1944. Um, and uh, both of those cases were consolidated at the ICJ and dismissed, basically saying Germany as a sovereign still enjoys sovereign immunity, even though there was widespread agreement that the underlying violations were serious use Kogan's uh, international or violations of international law. Um, and uh, there was also law, uh, litigation brought in France against the French railway for transporting um, Jews during the Vichy regime to internment camps. Um, in East Asia, uh, hundreds of victims have filed lawsuits in Japan, in South Korea, in the People's Republic of China, in the US and the Philippines people like comfort women, forced laborers, victims of medical experimentation and so forth, um, have also demanded compensation and apologies. Uh, in some, a global re-examination of World War II has expanded the public's understanding of who was responsible for humanity's darkest hour. Um, and while many European victims have enjoyed some measure of success in getting compensation, um, most Asians uh, on the whole have not, right? So one question I'll pose right now is, you know, why is that? Why have Europeans done so well, uh, or at least by comparison, whereas most Asians have not? Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn uh, over to our panelists. Um, Professor Nelson will go first, then Professor Basler, then Professor Livingston. Um, and I'm just going to say a few words about uh, each of these, um, each of my eminent co-panelists. It's of course um, I could go on and on about their uh, about their achievements, which are considerable. Um, but I'll just make a few comments. So uh, first speaker will be Kristen Nelson. Uh, she is a litigator at a boutique law firm in Los Angeles, but she has uh, lots and lots of international experience, including uh, a master's degree from the University of Hong Kong. In addition to her work in transnational litigation, uh, she's also extensively researched Holocaust restitution issues. Uh, along with Professor Basler, she is the author of Searching for Justice After the Holocaust, Fulfilling the Terrorism Declaration and Immovable Property Restitution, came out last year from Oxford University Press. Um, when she's not litigating, writing, or researching, 
Um, Ms. Nelson is also an adjunct professor of Holocaust Studies and International Law at Gratz College. Um, so welcome, Professor Nelson, and uh, we look forward to your remarks, and the metaphorical microphone is now yours. Thank you very much, Professor Webster, and uh, for this opportunity to be here on a Friday afternoon, late Friday afternoon evening, to talk about litigation history and memory of World War II. I'd like to take my portion of the time to provide kind of an overview of transnational ho Holocaust litigation and specifically how it arose in the 1990s, perhaps somewhat unexpectedly in US courts. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to back up this history a little bit and let's go back to the very end of World War II um, and look at the US response in 1945 to atrocities flowing from the war weighed heavily in favor of reliance on legalism as a means of achieving a measure of justice. Now, this wasn't the only path that was contemplated, but it was the one that the allies eventually agreed upon and they committed to criminally prosecute the most egregious perpetrators of injustices at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. Um, and this continued with a sort of distinctly American effort to put on subsequent Nuremberg trials, also in Nuremberg, which included sort of group prosecutions of individuals such as doctors who performed medical experiments on concentration camp um, members, and also members of the Einsatzgruppen, which were sort of the, the, uh, the mobile killing squads on the Eastern Front. So the American commitment to criminal justice came out early in the context of World War II. Yet a reliance in America on courts to facilitate a measure of civil justice for World War II and its attendant atrocities really didn't come about until 40, 50 years later until in the 1990s. And the US's ability to impact this late wave of justice in a positive way sort of came in four main forms, um, each of which often overlaps. And I'm going to shamelessly crib from Professor Basler's excellent book on Holocaust justice and Holocaust genocide and international law and call this the, the four-legged stool of American justice, which included um, the four realities that one, America is a plaintiff friendly jurisdiction where class actions are possible and where claims against foreign governments and other agencies or instrumentalities can be litigated. And I'm going to let him go into more detail about how this was possible. Um, the few memorable cases and the pending cases at the Supreme Court right now um, on uh, Holocaust era property claims. So we have plaintiff friendly jurisdiction. Second on the four legged stool is public officials willing to put a spotlight on the looting of Jewish property and insurance policies and the use of slave labor. And even in some instances, US officials being you know, willing to go so far as to threaten sanctions against particular companies as a means to get them to take Holocaust and uh, World War II era claims seriously. Third, we've got powerful Jewish organizations like the World Jewish Congress, such as the um, World Jewish Restitution Organization who continue to keep prominent focus on Jewish theft that occurred during the war. And finally, we have an independent American media that is um, more than willing to also keep a spotlight on stories of intrigue and valor in connection with searching out looted art and um, the return of other ill-gotten gains. And I'm gonna walk through two examples, well, maybe one example given um, our time constraints today of um, ultimately successful Holocaust justice efforts in the US. Um, the first one being from the early, from, from, from the 1990s, one of the first successful uh, US litigation. And the second, if we have time, being the most recent um, successful outcome arising from unsuccessful litigation. And both examples sort of demonstrate just how crucial all four legs of this American stool of justice is. The, the judicial component is but one, one factor um, in the success that the US has played in this sort of last and most recent wave of Holocaust justice. So let's first look at what is commonly known as the Swiss banks litigation. In a nutshell, this was a class action lawsuit in the US where European bank defendants sought to dismiss lawsuits. Defendants were exposed to extremely negative publicity. They were put under political pressure. The US government produces, produced you know, really damning um, reports of their bad wartime behavior. And then defendants um, don't really answer for their claims in a US court, but are able to craft a settlement without ever having you know, jurisdiction or merits of the case decided in a United States court. So what we call the Swiss banks litigation is maybe a little bit of a misnomer because no merits were ever decided by a judge. 
Um, Let's look at what's the factual basis for this particular this first lawsuit. Switzerland now, just as in the pre-war period, is known to be home to respected banks where money and other valuables are deposited for safekeeping. And after the war, destitute Holocaust survivors attempted to retrieve valuables and money from family-owned accounts almost wholly without success. They were thwarted at every turn by bureaucratic obstacles that kept survivors and their family belongings separated. One um, sort of very notable example is that Swiss banks were often requiring the death certificate of the original depositor to be provided in order for family members to um, obtain the contents of the of the bank account. Well, it's you know it's very well known that the Nazis didn't issue death certificates for those individuals that they killed in concentration camps. So with these insurmountable obstacles, the survivors who otherwise had rights to the contents of these of these boxes and accounts gave up. And it wasn't until the 1990s that Switzerland's true role in World War II, particularly with respect to banking, was sort of teased out through findings of multiple commissions. U.S. banking committee investigations, um, extensive reports, which really established and looked at how Switzerland benefited from the Holocaust. Um, and at this point, this was when Switzerland's sort of long-standing claim of wartime neutrality was really dismantled. And this included um, investigations that started in 1996 with the U.S. Senate Banking Committee. Um, it also included two additional commissions that uh, were opened in 1996, the Volcker Committee and the Bergier Commission um, that were also established to sort of assess Switzerland's role in World War II. So you have all of this background, you have all of this sort of investigation into what really happened in Switzerland with banking during World War II, and you're unearthing all of these new narratives of injustice. And then at the same time, in 96 and 97, a series of class action lawsuits are filed in US federal district court in New York against the banks for the return of the contents of these dormant accounts. And the lawsuits, of course, grabbed um, major international attention because one of them demanded $20 billion in compensation. That number alone um, was enough to, you know, to grab headlines. And eventually the cases were consolidated into a single, um, single action sort of known as in re Holocaust assets victim, victims assets litigation. And while the litigation continued, so we have we have the, the fact finding missions going on, we have the litigation, and then we have the banks under you know increasing pressure in Switzerland, they release information that okay, well, we found you know a certain number of dormant accounts, you know, totaling mm, $45 million. So there's admission that there are dormant accounts in Switzerland, but the number and the value is very low. So how do we get from the class action lawsuits, sort of the paltry claim of $45 million in dormant accounts to the largest Holocaust litigation settlement in the United States to date, which was $1.25 billion? Well, we didn't get there because the lawsuit won on its merits. The other legs of the four-legged stool of American justice came into play. First, it may well be greatly thanks to a sort of a whistleblower, a security guard at the bank, the Zurich branch of UBS, one of the defendant banks who discovered while on night duty, sort of scores of shredded pre-World War II documents in the basement of the bank. He took some of them and eventually they were turned over to the media in violation of Swiss secrecy, uh, banking secrecy laws. Um, but they, you know, this, this again, garnered worldwide attention. He became very famous. This, you know, this, you know, caused all kinds of um, like outrage and shame to the Swiss banking and you know Swiss banking industry. And at the same time, um, looking at another leg of this tool, we're looking at political pressure now. New York City's chief financial officer um, Alan Havesi threatened sanctions for the failure to reach a settlement. No, threatened. Excuse me. Threatened sanctions on defendants for failure to reach an agreement with the plaintiffs in the banking litigation. So, so he sort of threatens that you know the city would stop depositing certain investments with these Swiss banks because they're not reaching an agreement. So, in the face of bad publicity and you know increasingly bad facts being revealed in um, independent committees and through U.S. congressional investigations and reports, the Swiss banks settle the litigation. Um, for 1.25 billion, as I mentioned, and this is before the judge in this case, in this U.S. federal district case, ever had an, you know, never ever had the opportunity to rule on the motions to dismiss. Um, 
And I mean, this was, there's a lot of strategy going into this. The judge held off ruling on the decision, um, the, the decision on the motion to dismiss for a year in order to try to broker a settlement with the parties. Um, but ultimately this was sort of the, the mother of all Holocaust restitution settlements in court. And it led to the distribution of not only um, funds for persons who had um, money located in dormant accounts, but also for those who were victims of slave labor and those refugees who were denied refuge in Switzerland. And so let's look at the aftermath of the litigation. Um, it was monumental because it forced an entire industry to come to terms, often in a very public and uncomfortable way with its unsavory role in World War II. Um, but the reality for survivors of their heirs was that unless you had a dormant bank account that had a certain, you know, sort of some certain amount of money, you were really the recipient of sort of a symbolic payment. If you were a slave laborer um, and they had sort of been able to tie um, pretty much every, every um, company who engaged in slave labor in Europe to, um, you know, funneling money through Swiss bank accounts, you would receive a sort of a fixed sum of money, a couple of thousand dollars, but that was really, you know, from the $1.25 billion, the, the sort of the, the, the bulk of the payments were these sort of symbolic and small payments to, um, to sort you know, to survivors and family members of, of slave laborers and those who, who were denied refuge in Switzerland. Now, seeing as we're sort of time, I'm going to sort of blaze through the French Railroad example. And the difference, the difference in the French Railroad example um, from 2015 is that while the Swiss banks litigation, um, there was never any ruling on any of the merits or on jurisdiction, um, the cases against the Swiss Railroad, so this was for, I'm sorry, the French Railroad, for um, for carting um, individuals from transit camps just outside of Paris to their deaths in, Aus in, in Auschwitz. Um, the cases were dismissed in US courts, but that didn't end the sort of the negotiation or the ability to achieve a measure of justice in, in the United States because of the other, other legs of the four-legged stool, the mantle was taken up by um, the, you know, the, the so having politics get involved and having press get involved and, and again, threatening sanctions and, uh, or not threatening sanctions, but threatening um, the viability of the French National Railroad to be able to make, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, to, to, to make bids on American railroad um, contracts that, you know, that totaled in the billions of dollars, that really got them to the table to make an agreement. Um, let me just skip down to talking about what these two examples of U.S. how how they sort of refine our understanding of the war. Um, what's revealing in both the Swiss banks litigation and the French railroad settlement is that they provided a crystallization of key facts about the war that arose not within the not within the litigation itself, but sort of around the litigation. So for the Swiss banks litigation, it was the independent commissions, the US Senate Banking Committee, the brave testimony of the security guard from UBS that really helped break down erroneous historical narratives that Switzerland was neutral and blame free in World War II. And all of these elements really brought into sharp focus the lengths that Swiss entities went to deny restitution and justice in the post-war decades. And then for the French railways litigation, it may have been sort of a comparatively smaller settlement, but the truth of commercial railway, railway profiteering from transporting tens of thousands of individuals to their death back in World War II was really brought back into public consciousness through the litigation, through, um, we didn't get to speak about, through certain congressional testimony and proposed bills that would have allowed litigation of a similar nature to proceed in American courts. And you know, that, that didn't actually ever succeed. Um, however, what, what sort of the, 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 uh, the real common thread is the litigation on its own doesn't achieve the justice. It's one, it's one factor out of the four. And um, what really drives this home is I, I was, as I was preparing for this, this lecture, I was rereading some of the um, uh, writings of Judge Corman in the Swiss banks litigation. And when he upheld the settlement in that case as fair, he observed that in some other cases that had been dismissed against um, companies for German slave labor, he was um, looking, you know, he was, he was asked to look at to see what, whether some of the, the reasons that those cases were dismissed would have sort of um, bared upon the merits of the Swiss bank litigation. 
and whether they would have been applicable in that case. Um, he wrote the following and I'll close with this. He says, quote, I take no position regarding whether these lawsuits were correctly decided or whether they would even apply here. Instead, I cite them as a reality check for those objectors who believe that strong moral claims are easily converted into successful legal causes of action. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I think we'll hold off on questions until the end. Um, and I hope you guys will be thinking of questions to pose to uh, all four of the panelists. Um, but let me turn now to um, Professor Nelson's co-author uh, and himself an eminent authority on Holocaust restitution issues. Uh, and that's Michael Basler, who is a professor of law at Chapman University. Uh, and I, I think I can say one of uh, this country's, if not one of the world's leading legal authorities on Holocaust restitution issues. He's published uh, six books on these various subjects, including the one I mentioned uh, that he co-authored with Professor Nelson. Um, he also wrote a book called Holocaust, Genocide, and the Law, uh, among others. Uh, and that title won the 2016 National Jewish Book Award. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, pass the mic over to Professor Basler. Please. Thank you, Tim. I'm very happy to be here and to go ahead and to uh, be on the panel with uh, my distinguished colleagues and to provide this presentation. I just want to make sure you can see me fine and you can hear me fine. Okay, very good. All right. I will put on my timer so that I will make sure that I try to be as best as I can. Okay. So I, I want to begin with a general proposition and something that when I talk about um, Holocaust restitution, I try to go ahead and go just beyond the Holocaust and try to look at mass atrocities in general and, and uh, really genocide in general. And so my general statement I want to begin with um, is that part and parcel of every genocide is also mass theft. And the Holocaust is no exception. Uh, what is exceptional is that much of the efforts made for Holocaust restitution did not begin until the 1990s, as Professor Nelson has said, more than a half century after the end of World War II. Adding to this exceptionality is that the arena where the modern campaign of a restitution took place was not in Europe, where the Holocaust took place, but in the United States. More specifically, ground zero for Holocaust restitution was the US courthouse. And their alleged thieves and successors were sued under both international law and US law for monetary losses amounting to billions of dollars. Professor Nelson, her presentation already provided, already provided an overview and analysis of the Holocaust economic justice achieved in the United States through litigation and through these other you know, three other stools of that leg. Uh, let me add just a bit to our discussion. As I see it, uh, there have been three positive developments. One, Holocaust restitution litigation that began in 1990s has been positive most significantly by compensating still living, but now more and more shrinking uh, pool of Holocaust survivors that for losses that heretofore remained unresolved. Two, uh, the contemporary restitution efforts are very much ongoing in the 21st century. I read yesterday of a museum in upstate New York that returned a Nazi art painting um, to the family of the pre-war owners. There are, and I'll talk about this in a moment, two cases in the current term before the United States Supreme Court dealing specifically with this Holocaust restitution litigation. And there's another case, um, Nestle and Cargill, uh, versus Doe that involves the uh, alien tort statute that specifically looks at Nuremberg jurisprudence and the precedent for jurisprudence as to whether corporations uh, can be liable under um, international law. And the third point is that the litigation has an efficacy from the standpoint of a legal scholar is that Holocaust historians really overlook and what happened in the 1990s is American lawyers that in the 1990s and today, they were lit litigating the thievery that took place during the Holocaust, um, ended up working together with Holocaust historians. So it was the very first time uh, as I was watching this, as you had uh, trial lawyers and Holocaust historians coming together 
in order to get what we call as lawyers as evidence, the smoking guns, in order to go ahead and put those forth in their trials as part of what the, co the course that they're going to, you know, going to be making. And so, you know, it's my point that the historiography of the Holocaust, what we know about what happened, really has increased since the 1990s. And new histories have been written, not about the massive human losses, but about the theft that happened during the Holocaust as a result of this litigation. Um, what to me, these class action lawsuits are, even though they ultimately may not be successful, but they were, and I'll make an emphasis for this, the loud knock on the door, right, that made the various defendants, whether in Europe or in the United States, pay attention and say, we have to now deal with this problem or they didn't have to deal with it before. Now, as Professor Nelson already noted, the contemporary Holocaust restitution campaign began with the three class action lawsuits filed in 1996 against the Swiss banks. And those were settled in 1998 for $1.25 billion. We can talk more about this. And it's, it's really a, a, a grand uh, success from a larger point of view, um, called it the mother of all Holocaust restitution settlements. Because in my view, if those lawsuits had not settled, if Judge Corman, who was hearing the case, didn't bring all the parties together and try to resolve it, if there was no, um, um, you know, pressure done by um, California state officials, New York state officials, then I think in those situations, maybe this whole Holocaust search in the restitution movement have never gone anywhere and we'd not be talking about it today. After that campaign, the, those lawsuits succeeded, or after the lawsuits were filed, you were other claimants, other survivors also filing class action lawsuits. The second set of lawsuits involved Holocaust area insurance. And this is the failure by European insurance companies to honor Holocaust era life insurance policies. And I'll talk about this in a moment, some detail. Then what happened is then Holocaust survivors began filing lawsuits against what I call the, you know, the first category of perpetrators. These are the German companies who profited from slave labor during World War II. And it's estimated that during the World War II years, about 10 million people, both Jews and non-Jews, worked as slave laborers in the German economy. French and Austrian banks and British banks that uh, did business and occupied France during the German occupation were also sued for persecuting their Jewish customers and taking away their bank accounts. And the last one, which I think has sort of gotten the most publicity, is a Nazi Lurart museums, galleries, private collectors, both in the United States and abroad were being sued for the return of law, art looted by the Nazis from Jewish families that came in the hands of these institutions and private persons um, after the war. And the litigation, these fin the, the financial claims of the Holocaust in these US, court, US courthouses captured the public imagination in the 1990s, as Professor Nelson mentioned, and it brought Holocaust consciousness um, to the forefront. Timing was also right, because in 1993, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum opened up. So people were talking more about the Holocaust, what happened about the World War II. And then you have US public officials, both at the state and federal level, kind of putting the bright lights on these financial crimes. And like in the Swiss bank litigation, the New York Senator um, Alphonse D'Amato, who was the uh, chair of the Senate Finance Committee, issued subpoenas to Swiss banks to have them testify in bright lights as to why they were not returning money or deposits to Holocaust survivors or their heirs, even though that there was information that those accounts were there, or they refused to provide information on how many of these Holocaust era accounts that they had. Now, it's interesting that the very first case that happened to reach the Supreme Court involved Holocaust insurance. And this is the kind of history that I, I really didn't know much about. I mean, it's imagine yourself living in the 19, you know, um, 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, prior to the war. Um, you're living in Europe, middle class family. You want to protect your family. How do you do that? Well, you purchase life insurance. So, you know, purchase of life insurance was very common, and there were many companies, uh, both in Germany, outside of Germany, in Eastern Europe, that went around and sold life insurance policies. 
a number of these, these insurance companies actually targeted uh, Jewish customers. One of them was an Italian company called Azucarazioni Generali, which was the largest um, insurance company in Italy that was actually started by Jewish merchants in the 19th century. So among the Jewish community, it was known as kind of a Jewish company. And you had stories that survivors told that actual you know, insurance salespeople would come to their home, would go ahead, would try to sell the policy. They would come every year, collect the premiums on the policy. The problem was is that these uh, survivors and children, they said they didn't know who the policies were from. It wasn't like they were given a calendar from the insurance salesman that they had on their refrigerator and they could tell, or when they survived the war and their parents had perished, that they knew this is the particular policy from this particular insurance company. There were exceptions, but there were not. So the insurance companies like the Swiss banks were really reluctant to go ahead and provide this information. And so the activists in this area and their plaintiff lawyers basically came up with the motto, I think it's a really nice phrase, that if you suppress the names, you suppress the claims, right? You don't know who it is, so people are not going to go ahead and, and um, make claims for these policies. California, which was the home to the second largest community of survivors, then came to the rescue. Other states then followed. And California passed the law this is the California legislature signed by the governor called the Holocaust Victim Insurance Relief Act, HVIRA, forcing the companies to provide such data. Well, the insurance companies decided to challenge the law on constitutional grounds. And they went up all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in 2003 took cert and in a five to four decision declared the California law unconstitutional. According to the majority opinion, which was written by Justice Souter, the California law unduly encroached on the exclusive power by the federal government to engage in foreign affairs. Why? Because at the same time, the US government was involved in trying to have sort of a general settlement with the insurance companies of the same kind that happened with the Swiss banks. And so the insurance companies, as a result, created this international commission called the Holocaust Era insurance claims, uh, sorry, the Commission on Holocaust Era Insurance Claims, I-C-H-E-I-C or ICHEC, a body whose whole purpose was to pay on these insurance policies. But again, they were very reluctant to go ahead and issue you know, information about these policies. And that's what this California law was, was supposed to do. The Supreme Court said no, that this was a, a goal of the, foreign, of the federal government, they were looking at this also. And just because the federal government, the executive was looking at this and basically tried to get some kind of a settlement with these insurance companies, that this was forbidden territory and states could not come in. Individuals that you know, looked at this decision afterwards, uh, including myself, criticized that we were really unhappy that it was a five to four decision. One of the judges, justice has got to go on the other way and it would have upheld that. And I think we have found a lot more about the insurance policies and claims that exist. And but as a result of this, um, everything pretty much ended because the class action litigation against the insurance companies was then dismissed um, because the federal judge, Michael Mukasey in, in uh, New York and Manhattan said, look, there's another process, not litigation. We're gonna go through that, okay? So Supreme Court you know, did, did, not, did not help the survivors in that case. The second case that came to the Supreme Court involved Nazi looted art. And this was the famous Altman versus Austria case. So between 1933 and 1945, uh, the Nazis stole anywhere about 600,000 worth of artworks. Prices, we think the value of those, you know, would be astronomical in today, you know, over tens of, of millions of dollars. And there was an effort after the war to return some of that art, but a lot of it sort of dispersed all over the world. So let me give you one example. The, one of the first claims that was made was against the Israel Museum in Tel Aviv. So how does the Israel Museum happen to have a painting, a Pizarro, that was looted by the Nazis. 
It was a painting that was looted by the Nazis, made its way to the New York art market, bought by a collector who then donated that painting many years later to the Israel Museum. And it turned out that there was a widow living in Northern England who happened to be the heir of the person who had the painting prior to the war. And so, you know, the, the Israel Museum gave up the painting without having any kind of litigation. But the mess, most well-known looted art case was Altman versus Austria. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend seeing the Hollywood film, Woman in Gold. That suit was to f recover paintings stolen by the Nazis in 1938 from a wealthy Austrian Jewish family. The survivor, the niece of that family, was living in the United States. She ended up filing lawsuit in the United States, Maria Altman against Austria. That case also went to the United States Supreme Court. And um, Randy Schoenberg, who was a lawyer in Los Angeles, played in the movie by Ryan Reynolds. And Marie Altman was played by Helen Marin. Basically went to the Supreme Court. And the argument was very specific. The issue was, was the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which deals with losses against foreign sovereigns, was it um, retroactive? Because the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act provides an exception for expropriations taken in violation of international law. And taking these paintings from a Jewish family because they were Jewish clearly was is in violation of international law. But the law wouldn't apply. It came into being in 1976, unless it was retroactive. So the Supreme Court said that it was, and that was a really big you know, um, victory because afterwards Austria, who refused to deal with this case at all, made a proposal to Mrs. Altman. Why don't we take the case to arbitration? Private arbitrators will resolve this case and we agree that whatever will decide. And Randy Schoenberg convinced his client that if she doesn't agree to that, they're going to be fighting in American courts for the next 20 years. They went to arbitration, ran the one, and the paintings were returned. Okay, So you can see it's a big victory. We're now going to have another lawsuit that's going to be heard by the Supreme Court. And this is the Philip case. Uh, and it's Philip versus Germany. Similar type of case. This was artwork that was taken from German Jews in 1935, 1938. And in that situation, the artwork, the people that owned the artwork sold it, by sold it under duress. You know, Hitler came into power in 1933. There were all these anti-Jewish laws that came about. There was, a, a, you know, just a lot of economic pressure on the Jews. And so they ended up selling it to the Nazi elite. And in fact, these, these particular artworks were given to Hitler as a, as a present. Well, the lower courts recognized considering the open precedent that this was a violation of international law, comes within the expropriation exception. But Germany then appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court granted cert and we'll hear this case in December. The argument that Germany made is because these German Jews were nominally German citizens at the time when the painting was taken, taking of property, expropriation of property of citizens, you know, of a country by its own citizens, doesn't amount to a violation of international law. Technically correct, but it doesn't make sense in the context of the Holocaust. What is really, you know, strange about this is the United States government, the Solicitor General, filed a brief on behalf of Germany, saying, yes, we agree with that argument. Now, I am filing an amicus brief in that case next week. I just want to read you as a preview the first two sentences of my summary of argument. Uh, we're still working. It's a draft. I'm not sure it's going to make it. But you guys are going to be the first ones to hear it prior to you know, the Supreme Court, anybody else. And we say as follows. And this brief is filed on behalf of Holocaust survivors and Holocaust survivors organizations. Amikai are filing this brief from a sense of outrage and disbelief. Germany has the chutzpah to appear before the Supreme Court and argue that the property takings at issue in these cases were no different from standard commercial expropriation by any normal government if it's own national's property in ordinary course of activities. Jews 
who during the Holocaust were defined as a matter of law by their respective countries as untermenschen, subhumans, were stripped of their dignity, their citizenship, their nationality, their property, and for over six million of them for their lives, right? They became slaveless people with no rights under the law. Now, Germany argues no, that in fact they are citizens and they, sh they should be treated like any type of you know, transactions. And Mikai urged this court not to accept petitioners Holocaust denial denialism and revisionism. Holocaust related economic destruction and the link between that destruction and the ultimate destruction of German and European Jewry are a historical and legal fact. And Germany's position especially must be repudiated in its strongest possible terms. I'm gonna stop here. I know my time is up. I will tell you just in 10 seconds that there is another case that was filed against Hungary, also involving the transportation of Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz in 1944. That's a class action lawsuit. It's called Simon v. Hungary. That's gonna be heard at the same time. And the court will be deciding how the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act applies to this type of uh, expropriation, whether it, could, it works in this class action lawsuits. The oral arguments are on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, and you don't have to go to Washington DC because of COVID. It's going to be uh, audio stream. You can listen to it live. And the names of the two cases are Simon versus Hungary and Philip, P-H-I-L-I-P-P v. Germany, December 7th. Stay tuned. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the update about what's to come on the Supreme Court docket. Um, it's great to have both uh, Professor Basler and Professor Nelson um, tell us about what's going on in, in, their own, uh, in their own work, right? Because both of them are, are taking active stands in the in litigation or have played an active role in prior litigation. Um, so with that, I wanna move on to uh, our second to last speaker and that's um, Professor Michael Livingston, who is a professor of law at Rutgers Law School. Um, he is an eminent comparatist and legal historian and he's written about areas as diverse as taxation and Holocaust restitution. Um, Professor Livingston's book on Mussolini's race laws uh, entitled The Fascists and the Jews of Italy has become the standard account of this important, but I think overlooked uh, part of uh, World War II history. And so I'm looking forward to his remarks on um, the sort of general Asia versus Europe uh, difference that I was talking about in my opening remarks. So Professor Livingston, please. Thank you. I, uh... Everybody hears me okay? I, uh, I don't think I've ever been called eminent before. I, I, I assume that has to do with age rather than uh, an actual uh, accomplishment. You know, it's interesting. I, uh, I've gotten interested. I sort of move around the world. You know, I've been, I've been, I was doing all the I countries, Italy, Israel, uh, India, and then I guess Japan is a J country. I guess that's the next letter I got interested in Japan and I, I faced the problem and I got in touch with, with Tim. I faced the problem that uh, I didn't really know very much Japanese. I don't know how, how many of you except Tim have tried to study Japanese, but it's, it's not the easiest language. Like if you wanna say, I like sushi, it seems like a fairly simple sentence. You have to say something like, I subject marker, sushi object marker, am liking very, very much or something like that. I mean, the whole like kind of, so I, I wanted to have something to say about this topic coming from outside. So we said, well, why don't you talk about the comparative side, uh, you know, Asia and Europe. And indeed, I mean, it is the case that, I mean, as you know, you know, Germany and Japan were our two biggest opponents uh, in World War II. Italy gets in there, others get in there, but uh, you know, those were the two biggest opponents. They both lost and they both uh, committed a fair number of war crimes. And I think the, the German crimes are better known in the United States and Europe. Everybody knows about the Jewish Holocaust. I mean, you know, six million dead, including, uh, you know, people in my family, including people in essentially every uh, European Jewish family. Uh, and, you know, and that's only part of it. I mean, numbers, you know, are just staggering. I mean, however many people dead in Poland, 
in, in uh, Yugoslavia. I think in Russia, you can't even really get a count of how many people are, are, were killed. And I'm talking about civilians, you know, not, not just the military casualties. So I think that's pretty well known. And there's a number of trials after the war, criminal trial, other criminal trials in, in separate countries, you know, all sorts of civil actions. And I think the previous presenters have talked about some of them which are continuing today. And, you know, some of them succeed, some of them don't succeed. But they're certainly not frivolous. I mean, there's certainly and there, there's political pressures as well as legal pressures. I mean, it's certainly something that people are aware of. I think, you know, in Asia, people, at least in the United States, are somewhat less aware of it. But, you know, I mean, you know, part of the problem is that the United States got into uh, the war against Japan in, in 1941, and not really by choice, you know, because we were attacked or from the Japanese perspective, we had taken aggressive actions against them. But, you know, militarily, we were attacked. Uh, but the war had been going on a long time before that. The war started arguably with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931, at very latest with the invasion of the rest of China or so-called China proper in 1937. And there's a whole litany of misbehavior. I mean, from the rape of Nanking and similar atrocities in, in, in China to, uh, you know, there are suggestions that as many as a million people will work to death on, on railroads and other projects in what's now Indonesia. Uh, I mean, atrocities against, you know, Western uh, 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 and non-Western prisoners are actually worse against the non-Western prisoners. Uh, you know, slave labor, comfort women, I mean, uh, Tim's discussed some of that. Certainly no, no shortage of, uh, of atrocities, but you know the legal redress for them has been not exist, not not non-existent, but somewhat more limited. I mean, it kind of depends who and where. There were a series of Japanese reparation payment. Well, there were the war crimes trials in Tokyo after the war, but which have a kind of mixed reputation uh, because this decision was made by MacArthur and the others. Uh, the US basically ran the occupation of Japan, even though there was supposedly a joint commission. Uh, but, uh, you know, the decision was made to, uh, to kind of blame it all on Tojo and the other, the so-called militarists to let the emperor off the hook and so on. I think some of this, I may be reading in, but I think some of this was people, you know, knew the history of Germany after World War I and what had happened after the Kaiser uh, left and hadn't turned out very happily. And there was a sense there was a threat of communism in Japan. And there was a sense that if you kept the emperor on the throne, even at the cost of lying a little bit, that that was gonna be a better thing for Japan and certainly for the United States relationship with Japan. Uh, so there were those kind of more limited war crime trials. There were a series of reparation payments to mostly Southeast Asian countries in the 50s. But uh, then a long period where not much happened. I mean, China took the position, the Chinese communist government, that they didn't want reparations, either for reasons of pride or because it wasn't the fault of the Japanese people. It was the fault of, uh, of the militarists, again. Uh, so by and large, there was a lot of talk about apology to China, a lot of investments in China that had sort of a compensatory aspect, but, but uh, you know, they, they didn't ask for formal reparations. Uh, with Korea, now Korea had been treated as part of Japan and during the occupation, so during the war, so it's kind of an odd situation, uh, legally speaking. But uh, there was an agreement with Korea, I think, in the 1990s that, in theory, liquidated claims of Korea against Japan. But again, not necessarily against private firms, not necessarily comfort women and so on. So kind of an incomplete feel to that uh, as well. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of the stuff just kind of fell by the wayside and, and never really got dealt with. And certainly, uh, I mean... There's a lot of mixed feelings in Japan about this. I mean, the last prime minister, the outgoing prime minister, Abe, who was coincidentally the grandson of Kishi, who was a, uh, both a prime minister, but also before being prime minister had been accused probably correctly of being a, a war criminal. Uh, so, you know, he was very much identified for the, for, for the position that it's enough apology, you know, we've had too much of this. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, 
you know, it's a very different situation than in Europe. And certainly there's a less of a consciousness of it in the United States. So the question is why? So I'm going to talk about a few of the reasons why. And this is a little odd because you're sort of doing the conclusions before you did the, the research. So what we're really doing is we're talking about hypotheses. Here. Like somebody told me that when the French say hypothèse, it's like sort of somewhere between a theory and what we would call a hypothesis. So this is somewhere between a theory and, and a hypothesis and more research has to be done. But I think a few reasons why. I mean, one is just a different situation of Germany and Japan. And I was very surprised to learn this when I started reading. I did not realize this. I don't think most people realize it. But the post-war history of Germany and Japan is completely different. I mean, Germany basically ceased to exist in 1945. It was divided into four occupation zones. Uh, people you know, didn't know when that would end. Eventually the three Western zones became West Germany. The three Eastern zone, the Eastern zone, the Russian zone became East Germany. A lot of the country was now in Poland or Russia or altogether, France altogether. But, uh, but it basically ceased to exist. That never happened in Japan. The minute you know, I mean, the day after the atomic bomb fell, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the day after the surrender on the battleship Missouri, there was a Japanese government, there was a Japanese prime minister, there was an emperor, and basically MacArthur just landed in Japan and started giving them orders, started telling them what to do. And, you know, I mean, the reasons for that weren't necessarily that we were nice guys. I mean, people hated Japan. At a, well, you know, you can look. I mean, it's just, you know, it's it's hard to blame people at, at, at the time because it was so different. But, you know, you can look at films made during the war of, of American aircraft clearly bombing civilian areas of Japanese cities. I mean, not even really making a serious attempt to hit military targets, and people were happy about it. I mean, people the the incendiary bombs I think were made in New Jersey, and uh, people people were quite happy about this. You know. Uh, so there, it wasn't that we were nice guys. It was the, the cal political calculation. And it was also just a cultural fact. Somebody has estimated that other than uh, Japanese immigrants, uh, there were probably fewer than 100 Americans who were fluent in Japanese in 1941, you know. And indeed, MacArthur was distrustful of any Americans who spoke Japanese because he thought they would go native and he wouldn't carry out his policies. So they didn't really have, they couldn't even if they wanted to, you know, there were no sort of like Henry Kissingers who were like fluent in German and you could put them in charge of cities in Germany and run the occupation policy. I mean, basically they just started giving orders in English through translators saying, do this, do that. And the Japanese government did it. But of course the cost for that you know, is that there's a big translation function. This is like that movie Lost in Translation, but 40 years earlier, you know, I mean, one just classic example, this is a little bit off topic, but one just classic example of this is that, that they told the Japanese that they wanted a clause in the constitution that said that the emperor denounced divine uh, descent, you know, that he wasn't descended from a sun god and so on, he was just another person. And somehow in Japanese that came out that the emperor himself was not divine, which is a little bit different than not being descended from something divine, because you could not be divine, but you could still be descended. It's actually quite a bit different. I mean, it's mm. actually, but you know, I mean, it's you know, the different languages, different cultures, it, uh, and there were a lot of examples kind of uh, kind of like that. And so part of it is that, you know, and that ties in with the exoneration of the emperor. In fact, when, when Tojo who was ultimately executed, Tojo uh, got up in court one day and said, you know, we, we, we did this because we knew the emperor wanted it. We never would have done this if the emperor didn't want it. They went to him the next day and said, you have to change that testimony. If you don't change that testimony, they're going to have to arrest the emperor and you will be responsible for the arrest of the emperor. And he changed it. He said, oh, I, you know, I was just sort of like that scene in The Godfather, you know, so I was just kidding. You know, I, I didn't really mean it, you know, and he, uh, I mean, these people were not cowards. They were not very nice people, but they were certainly not cowards. So part of it was this very, very different history in Japan than in Germany. And look, I mean, if, if, the, if the occupying power in Japan 
is saying that the people weren't responsible. Only a small clique of militaries were responsible. It's awfully hard for somebody else to come in and say, you know, well, we're blaming the people. <laughs> you know, this, you know, this is the conquering power saying that it wasn't really your fault. It was the it was a, you know, Tojo and a few militarists. Well, so the history is very different. The history within Asia is also different. I mean, Germany, and this takes a while, but Germany by the, is tied up by the 1950s in the coal and steel community with France, which becomes the European economic community, which becomes the European community, which becomes the EU. So at least Western Germany, I mean, you know, there's a question of whether the, what's happened with Austria and East Germany and so on, there's still problems there. But at least West Germany, which is the bulk of it, is very much tied in. And part of it being tied in is that they have to kind of accept a certain responsibility. And that involves, you know, uh, reparations to Israel uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, payments to other countries and so on. I mean, it doesn't mean that there are no issues, but it, you know, that's part of it. There's really no equivalent to that in Japan. Remember that the, the communist government takes over in China in, 19, in 1949. There's the Korean War in 1950. It's a Cold War all this period. So that, the, you know, Japan is basically, there for, for 20, 30 years, their whole foreign policy is basically oriented to the United States and the allies of the United States. They don't really have a close relationship between, uh, between, uh, you know, like you have uh, in Europe. So there isn't the pressure. There starts to be pressure in the 90s, but there isn't pressure early on. So, you know, one thing is, is the internal dynamic. The second thing is the local dynamic. Uh, you know, a third thing, now this is squishier and you have to be careful here because you don't want to get into like, you know, essentialism and, 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 and so forth. But I don't think it's going out on a limb to say that the legal and political culture uh, in Japan and in Asia generally is, is a little bit different, you know, than in the West. And we talked about the West being a litigation friendly society, the United States being a litigation friendly society. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Japan, you know, is not as much of a litigation friendly society. I mean, I think there's a little bit more of a sense, these are generalizations, but there's a little bit more of a sense in Asia of resolving things by, uh, but by compromise or by negotiation, not necessarily but by litigation. I know, I know in the environmental area, if they looked at too, it took quite a while to establish the idea in Japan that you, that citizens could sue a, a lot of pollution in Japan, but that citizens could sue, private citizens could sue a corporation for, uh, for, for environmental damage. It took a long time to establish in Japan, it was, but it took a long time to, to, to establish. So, uh, you know, it's a different culture. And I think the role, again, you don't want to be too generalizations too much, but I think the role of honor and, and apology is maybe a little bit, a bit bigger in Asia. Europe, for example, you had this thing in Japan where there's this shrine in Tokyo, uh, you know, that, that includes, you know, the remains or whatever of lots of Japanese soldiers who were killed, but also of Tojo and these other war criminals and so on, which isn't just that they happen to be there. I mean, there was a whole, organized effort to make sure that they were included there. I mean, it didn't, it didn't just, it didn't just happen. So, uh, so, uh, so that's part of it. You know, that's different. I mean, obviously racism is one part of it. There's an allegation, is a suggestion that, uh, you know, that uh, America's own atrocities in Vietnam and Korea are part of it, that we don't want to bring up the issue. There's the issues of domestic politics as well. I mean, you know, where this leads you, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to think that, you know, the, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, whole honor and apology thing can be an advantage as well. Uh, I, I think that the future there is probably more in the nature of restorative justice and of uh, kind of, uh, you know, repaired relationships and probably a little bit less in terms of, of litigation, but that's, uh, that's an instinct of mine. I mean, that's not really a deep analysis. As I say, I think it has to await, uh, a deeper analysis has to await further study. Okay, yeah. thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, and that's uh, a great segue. We started with um, the United States and then we went to Europe and then Michael has brought sort of transected uh, Eurasia and brought us over to um, 
to East Asia. And that's where I'm going to begin my remarks. So uh, I do have some PowerPoint slides. Uh, I will do my best to share them with you and uh, hope that I won't embarrass myself. Let me try that again. Let's see here. So can you guys see the screen or am I, am I embarrassing myself? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Now we can. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yes, we are all set now. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, we're What's seeing good? presenter views. Oh, there, that's good. That works? Okay, fabulous. Yeah. Um, cool, so uh, again, my name is Tim Webster. I teach at Western New England University and uh, I'm glad to be um, here and I'm glad to see so many people still on at, uh, what time is it? 7.11 on a Friday night. So uh, without further ado, let me launch into what I'm gonna talk about. So um, my piece here looks solely at the issue of the comfort women and in particular at litigation that comfort women have brought in Japan. Comfort women have brought litigation in Korea, they've brought litigation in the Philippines, they've brought litigation in the United States, um, but most of the litigation has taken place in Japan. And I wanna um, use this uh, litigation to um, understand dynamics between the judiciary and the executive branch. Um, and also try to understand what, if anything, can be gleaned uh, from litigation. So we've, we've heard in, in prior uh, panel, prior discussions, that litigation can sort of move the ball forward, but at some point, other actors have to step in to resolve the problem. And I think that's a, that's a, a nice um, segue to this presentation, which uh, I think would largely agree with that, right? There has been plenty of litigation over comfort women issues in Japan. Uh, there have been a couple of, uh, of, of agreements that uh, the Japanese government has come up with, um, but those have sort of lacked um, uh, maybe a legitimacy or lacked uh, consultations with comfort women themselves. Uh, and so this is still an ongoing issue in need of resolution in, in, in 2020. So um, I'll first describe uh, what comfort women were. Uh, I'll describe some statements that Japanese officials have made and their importance. Uh, then I'll look at some of, the, some of the lawsuits and then I will end with some thoughts about uh, the truth function, if we can call it that, of civil litigation generally. Okay, so uh, that's a, a brief, a brief uh, overview. Um, you know, many of you know this already, but I think it's helpful just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, who were the comfort women? This is a, a group, no one's entirely sure how many, somewhere between 100 and 200,000 women, uh, primarily Korean, but also Japanese, uh, uh, Taiwanese, both indigenous Taiwanese and the Han ethnicity, uh, Dutch women, Filipino women, and so forth. And, and these were women uh, who were recruited largely against their will or through deception or coaxing. I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. Um, and then they were trafficked to what are called comfort stations. Uh, and essentially these, you can think of them as, uh, you know, brothels isn't quite the right word because in English at least brothel is a place where prostitutes who are themselves willingly uh, there um, uh, to, to, to sell their bodies. Um, whereas most of the women, if not all the women in the comfort women system were there against their will, either they were forced um, by violence or they were deceived into uh, joining this, um, these comfort stations. And uh, the reason that Japan set these up in the first place, again, beginning in the early 1930s and, and throughout the 1940s as well, um, was to prevent Japanese soldiers from raping civilians, right? The idea was, well, we'll have these uh, quote unquote brothels that can be regulated, right? We can actually test the women, make sure they don't have uh, sexually transmitted diseases, make sure they don't get pregnant. Uh, and this will help, um, I don't say smooth over, but help ensure that the civilian population of China or Southeast Asia or Indonesia or whatever Japan, whatever territory Japan happened to invade um, would not uh, sort of blow back against uh, Japanese raping of their women, right? The idea was we'll, we'll keep it um, uh, contained uh, and we'll keep it regulated. And this is how we will uh, allow our soldiers to gain comfort, right? So the comfort here is not for the women themselves, obviously, it's for uh, Japanese soldiers who are going through the stresses of, uh, of battle. 
Um, now, uh, this issue largely disappeared after the war, um, but in the early 1990s, uh, for you know, for a number of reasons, some of which I put on the screen here, uh, the issue uh, reasserts itself or reemerges. Um, and there's uh, there's sort of multiple points at which this comes out. Um, I think the main uh, root of this is from uh, from South Korea, a, a, a civil society group run by a professor at Yihua University, uh, is established in 1990 uh, to research this issue and also to raise awareness both within Korea uh, as well as in East Asia and around the world about this largely forgotten or overlooked war crime. Um, there are also uh, political factors within Korea itself, uh, as well as within Japan and, and the region more generally, that allow a sort of a relaxation of, uh, of, of pressure, relaxation of authoritarianism, uh, the, democ the democratization of, uh, of Korea in 1987 is part of that. Uh, the death of the of Emperor Hirohito in Japan also forces people in Japan to rethink uh, their own history. Um, and, and in Japan itself, I think this is an important point that might get overlooked, there are a number of uh, lawyers, a number of historians, a number of activists who are very sympathetic to the idea that Japan has not sufficiently atoned for the war. Uh, and they too are mobilized to bring this issue to the forefront. Um, so uh, let me begin now by talking uh, more in more detail about some of the statements that Japanese officials have made about the comfort women. And, and the first one, I think, and the first maybe important one, comes from a, an official in the Ministry of Labor, or the Japanese Ministry of Labor, who testifies as following to the Diet uh, in June of 1990. He says, uh, based on a question posed to him by a socialist member of the Japanese Diet. So again, just to uh, to go back to what Professor Livingston was saying a little while ago, um, Abe Shinzo is the prime minister and he represents the very conservative nationalist uh, denialist wing of Japanese politics. Of course, his party, the LDP, has been, has been in power for most of, uh, most of the post-war period. Um, and so, you know, a member of the LDP is sitting there in the diet being grilled by a member of one of the left-wing parties, in this case, the socialists, uh, about this issue of comfort women. And, and the ministry official responds, says, from the interviews we had with former soldiers, our conclusion thus far is that the so-called comfort women were prostitutes working in brothels whose private owners took them around wherever the Imperial Army went. To this extent, uh, the Ministry of Labor cannot conduct any further investigation as it is beyond our remit, okay? So that's the first, uh, you know, quasi-denial. The, the denialism will, will, uh, will peak in, in later, uh, later statements, but here you already get a sense of, okay, these are prostitutes, right? Women uh, willingly selling their body. Uh, these are private entities not related to the Japanese government or the Japanese military. Um, and, you know, we're not going to look into this issue anymore, right? We're, you know, it's beyond, it's beyond the remit of the Labor Department. So um, this denial uh, is picked up in Korean media. And um, this woman hears about it. This is a woman named Kim Hak-soon. Uh, and she is the first person in the post-war period to publicly acknowledge that she had been a comfort woman. And, and she says this uh, in part to refute the claims that um, this labor minister, labor official, uh, as well as other Japanese officials had made, essentially denying or sugarcoating this uh, comfort women system. So she steps forward and, and publicly acknowledges to the Korean council I, I mentioned before that she had been a comfort woman uh, transported from Korea to China during the war. Um, and then uh, the other important thing to know about uh, Ms. Kim here is that she actually launched or initiated the first, uh, or among the first, I should say, uh, transnational war reparations lawsuits in Japan, right? So on Pearl Harbor Day, right, as someone was saying before, um, she, uh, with the help of these Japanese attorneys and activists I've mentioned before, files this first of what turns out to be um, nearly, or actually over 100 lawsuits that have been filed in Japan, right? And she demands that the Japanese government compensate her uh, and issue her an apology for subjecting her to this particular form of sexual bondage and, and sexual slavery. 
Now, um, within a few weeks, there is a report that appears in the Asahi Shimbun, the sort of major left-leaning Japanese uh, daily that says, that actually provides a, a clear link between the comfort women system and the Japanese government, right? So the, 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 the wool is slowly being pulled uh, or pulled up, pulled away from, pulled up from uh, the eyes of the Japanese people. And um, this uh, publication actually has, has quite an impact. Um, but uh, you know, before I, I continue on with this narrative, let me just sort of put this in perspective because as I said, in, in the wake of Ms. Kim's lawsuit here, you have uh, you know, lots of comfort women, lots of forced laborers, lots of uh, victims of medical experimentation and so forth coming forward in Japan, coming forward in South Korea, coming forward in China, uh, in the Philippines and the United States, seeking the same kinds of compensations and reparations that uh, we saw in Brooklyn, right? As Professor Nelson was suggesting um, and, and other places in the United States as well, right? So there's, there's an even more active uh, litigation scene deriving or coming out of uh, Asia than there is in the United States or even Europe, okay? So uh, that's a little, uh, a little side note. Um, so, so afterwards, you know, more and more facts are, are, uh, are discovered. Historians, uh, you know, scour archives and find additional evidence. Um, and then uh, in 1993, you have, uh, again, uh, a liberal democratic party official named Kono Yohei, make the following statement. Um, uh, and this is uh, a translation. He says, comfort stations were operated in response to the request of the military authorities of the day, right? So again, it's, it's, it's making that connection a little bit clearer. And then he says, well, the, the then Japanese military was directly or indirectly involved in the establishment and management of comfort stations and the transfer of comfort women. Uh, the recruitment of the comfort women was conducted mainly by private recruiters who acted in response to the request of the military. Okay, so here we, we, there's, a, there's a, a stronger connection between the military and the comfort women system, but there's still this kind of hedging language about directly or indirectly. Um, and so people still look at this. And again, it, it's important to point out that this statement um, has become, as you'll see here, the sort of the high watermark of Japanese government's assumption of responsibility for the comfort women statement, right? So again, even though it has that hedging language of directly or indirectly involved, um, this in 1993 is sort of the, the farthest any um, LDP, Liberal Democratic Party official will go when talking about the comfort women. Um, and I think just as important since that time, right? Since 1993, um, members of this conservative political party I've just talked about uh, have denounced this statement um, they've tried to attenuate the link between the government and the comfort women system, uh, and they've tried their best to portray comfort women as, as I said before, willing prostitutes. Um, and again, the, the, the prime, pun intended, uh, example of this would be Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, who said in March of 2007, he said, there is no documentary evidence to prove a forcible act, right? So he's saying, look, at this point in 2007, nobody can point to a document, right? Or, or a legal instrument that proves that the women were uh, forced into the system against their will, right? So again, it, it, it's, a, it's a different form of denialism, um, but it's still undercutting this idea that women did this, um, uh, you know, of their, of their own will, right? He's saying, look, these are essentially people who weren't forced into it. They're just prostitutes. They don't deserve our attention. They don't deserve our, uh, they don't deserve our compensation. Um, so this is a very brief uh, overview of the lawsuits that were filed in Japan. Um, all of them failed ultimately. They were all dismissed. And you can see for some of the reasons, because of a treaty, because they were time, time barred, because of sovereign immunity claims. Um, and we can talk about these in more detail in the Q&A, but what I want to do now is use these lawsuits as an antidote to the kind of denialism and the downplaying and this, these, these attempts to, um, to separate the government from the comfort women system, right? So this, this, uh, this first quote I've translated here uh, comes from the Kim hak -sun opinion that was handed down by the Tokyo High Court in 2003. Um, and this is important because it says it you know, quite, uh, you know, quite clearly that the former Japanese army 
uh, established military comfort stations for the purposes of prostitution, right? So no indirect or direct, uh, no beating around the bush. This is very clearly implicating the Japanese army in the creation of military comfort stations, right? So I think this is, this is one way of, uh, of, of addressing um, some of this, uh, some of these denialist statements made by uh, LDP politicians. Um, again, same opinion goes on to say, uh, many comfort stations were operated by private actors, which opened with the permission of the former Japanese army. But in some areas, there were cases where the stations were directly operated by the former Japanese army. So saying, yes, true, some of them were actually privately run and operated, but uh, many others were also directly operated by the former Japanese army. Again, making that involvement piece quite clear and unequivocal. Um, uh, to, the, to the claim that women did this uh, voluntarily, um, a different suit uh, filed in, in the Yamaguchi District Court in Japan says actually the women were uh, you know, not told what they were going to do, not told what awaited them, were given what were sort of recruited uh, with lines like, do you want to go to Japan and make some money? Do you want to go uh, work in a factory in Japan? Um, and it's important to point out, you might say, well, this isn't very, this isn't very convincing, but a lot of the people, a lot of the Korean women in particular who were targeted were teenagers, right? So the, the two people I have on the screen right now were uh, 17 and 19. Um, and again, a lot of the women who have, who have filed these lawsuits were recruited at age 13 or 14, right? So, you know, again, it's, it's, it's easier, I suppose, to trick a 13-year-old or a 17-year-old than it would have been, obviously, to, um, to dupe an adult. Um, final uh, sort of uh, piece of translated uh, comes from a case brought by a Chinese comfort woman. Um, this is pretty graphic, so I, I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, but again, this woman was 15 when she was taken by the Japanese army. Uh, and, and I raise this, you know, not to be graphic and to, and to sicken you, um, but just because it, it, it depicts in, in quite uh, graphic detail the experiences of, again, this 15-year-old Chinese girl uh, who was raped and harmed, um, uh, you know, in a cave, essentially, um, by the Japanese military. Right, so I, I won't read out the entire uh, quotation, but it's, as I said, it's, it's fairly graphic and fairly disturbing. Okay, so in my, uh, in my last couple of minutes, I just wanna um, suggest, uh, and then I'll open it up to discussion and, and questions from all of you, that um, you know, judicial opinions have a role in asserting historical fact. Uh, and again, many, I think, common law lawyers would sort of bristle at that idea that uh, judicial opinions are somehow embodiments of truth. Um, uh, Bob Summers, among others, suggests that there's sort of a substantive truth or actual truth out there. But what we get in our adversarial common law system is something called formal legal truth, right? So again, maybe the lawyer didn't do all of his work or he couldn't get the right, uh, right evidence together. Um, but I, I think when we look at civil law jurisdictions, right, there's a, a much stronger attempt to actually get at that truth wherever it may be, right? And so what I want to suggest in, my, in the final moments here, is that uh, we can use these opinions, and, and maybe we should use opinions like this, um, to, because they're they're more deliberate, right? They're more nuanced. They're, there's actually much more historical um, uh, fact finding in certainly in these cases, and perhaps in civil law jurisdictions more generally. Um, and so, instead of uh, thinking about Japan as uh, you know the the the, or the Japanese view on this as something that comes from people like Abe, um, we might look instead to the opinions issued by Japanese courts, which even if they didn't actually find and, and order compensation awards to the comfort women, uh, did, a, did a fairly um, accurate and thorough job of portraying the facts. And again, I, I come at this in 2020, um, cognizant and perhaps worried by the fact that our own right, country is being dominated by somebody who lies, you know, dozens of times a day, uh, and trying to come up with some way to get around, um, you know, the fake news and, and all the other dissimulations that we're used to in the White House. I think a similar thing can be said about uh, Japanese politicians, at least of a certain stripe. Uh, and so, in response to that, maybe we want to focus our attention away from, you know, the latest Trump outrage or the latest Abe outrage and look to other government actors for a more um, nuanced and perhaps a more deliberate understanding of history, okay? Um, so with that, I will, uh, I will end my remarks. 
Um, and I hope to uh, I hope that you guys are still awake, first of all. Uh, and I hope that you might have uh, <laughs> people are waving hands. Good. Um, I hope you guys might have uh, some questions or some comments um, or something else. We have about 10 minutes uh, to discuss. And so um, you can either uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Oh, and I, I see that uh, Professor um, Kim Lynch Pelly from uh, Princeton has already uh, jumped the queue. So Kim, please. Yeah, thank you. This was uh, fascinating. And I, you know, one thing I'm so struck by, and it's really useful to hear all these papers together, because on one hand, they're very different types of claims, very different types of proof. Um, but they all share something in common. So one is how Kim, I think you've muted yourself. I'm sorry to say. There we go. Yep. Sorry. I've been having trouble with Zoom all day for some reason. Yeah. So anyway, so one of the so there's these cases have you know a lot in common. That's why they're on the same panel, um, and they have a lot in common because they all start very late. So you know it's just in general hard to win cases where you're starting the cases you know 50 years after <laughs> the events. Um, there's also something else which is that these are also all uh, mass cases that tend to be produced through individual evidence, right? So you need individual claimants who have lost something concrete. And part of what you have to do is figure out what happened to them specifically. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, when you, when historians are thinking about <laughs> the big picture, they, they're not so focused on what happened to concrete individuals. So you can, you can prove that states did things in general without being able to prove that they did things to these specific people in court, right? So the idea of causation and proof is, is very different for these kinds of big historical events. So one thing I wonder is whether, now that you've been through looking at all these court cases, <laughs> whether court cases are the right ways to handle this, right? So we think about, you know, at the ends of wars where there are mass atrocities, there are certain kinds of, you know, in fact, these were, were wars that actually ended in surrenders and you know formal declarations of surrender should we think about how we end wars differently right is there something about you know about the ways war ends that the ways that wars <laughs> end that would make these kind of cases easier to to um i'm, I'm already had about it's hard it's hard for anybody who's a law professor not to think about litigation right but that would provide some kind of justice for the victims without necessarily requiring the kind of proof that a lawsuit requires, right? So it, it's a general problem, so, that, so there's that problem. There's also another problem, and I thought of this when, um, when Michael um, Bezler was talking about how, you know, there's all this theft that goes on. Of course, one of the things about wars is that a lot of the victims are no longer around you know, to bring the cases. So you've got, shall we say, a subsample of those who were grievously injured. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that wars do is they change the landscape, you know, that all those people who died are no longer there. It changes what the history looks like from that point forward. And as long as we remain in kind of litigation mode, there isn't really a way to handle the, the way that, that wars, um, irreparably change the environment. And I think about this because I work in Eastern Europe, just to give just one example of what I mean. Um, Poland didn't used to be all Catholic. <laughs> and now it mostly is. And the fact that it's all Catholic is now being used as, you know, sort of claims to constitutional identity by the current government. And you want to say to them, well, you know, one of the reasons why you guys are all Catholic now, you know, is that it wasn't entirely your fault, but, you know, a lot of you collaborated in wiping out the entire Jewish population of Poland, right? So one of the consequences of the Holocaust is that all the countries, you know, that lost their Jewish populations are entirely different now. And this is where nationalism is coming back, right? In a way that maybe, anyway. So I guess what I'm wondering is whether, because we're so focused on law mode, we don't think enough about, you know, how to really undo or to have a, a better resolution of the claims of the living and the what it meant that the dead were lost. Big question, but do you ever get through this thing and think, gee, they should have done something else? 
Yeah, so um, I, I think what we'll do, I think there's there's one other question from Margaret Wu that I'd like to hear, and then I'll give everybody maybe a minute to respond both to Kim's and then to Margaret's question. So um, Professor Wu, if you could make your comment, uh, and I don't mean to be rude, but if you could do it briefly, that would be even better. Unmute yourself as well, please. Uh, it kind of follows up on what Kim just said in a sense, but I have a different take and I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't hear all the papers. But, it, but, but I'm concerned less about resolution and I'm more fascinated by the idea of using litigation to rewrite history. And that is that it's really using the claims to uh, clarify and um, to document a period of history that has not been documented. So that's true for the comfort women, it's true for some of the reparations for, you know, uh, 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 for the property that were lost by um, you know, Jewish uh, residents in Germany. And I gather that must have been what the earlier conversations were about, but, but I really see it more, really less about reparations and more about rewriting history through litigation. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm gonna try to wrap this all up by 7.40. If we, if we go into 7.42 or 7.44, please don't hate me. But I think what I'd like to do is just go through this alphabetically uh, and ask Professor Basler and then Professor Livingston and then Professor Nelson if they have responses either to Kim's question or to Margaret's question, uh, and then I'll make a couple of comments at the end. So um, Professor Basler, if you'd like to weigh in on either uh, Kim's or, or uh, Margaret's intervention, that would be great. Sure, I'll take both. Um, Kim, first of all, I just wanna say, I've admired your work for so long. So actually to see you a part of this participating, thank you so much, it's great to see you. I finally get to meet you this close by. Uh, but I wanted to say that it's it's writing or rewriting history. That's that's the thing. In other words, as you can see from the amicus brief that I read you, I feel like history is trying to be rewritten. Uh, and so that is the danger that we have in any one of these proceedings. Um, you know, Tim, you also mentioned that. I, mean, I just wonder like, okay, we can say that Japan has a civil law system and therefore judges are fact finders. But I just wonder the statements that those judges issued and those opinions that you put out, how are they different in terms of fact finding? How do they get to those conclusions from the decisions that they were issued by American judges? You know, so for instance, in the Simon case, the decision begins in the, um, the Circuit Court of Appeals. The Holocaust in Hungary was one of the most horrendous acts in human you know, history in terms of the speed that the number of you know people that were killed. That's a statement, right? That statement had to come from somewhere. It came from the materials that were put to the court before the lawyers. We could have a whole panel on this. That's that's a really interesting, you know. Um, uh, topic. Indeed, we have a whole panel on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Michael Livingston, if you please. Yeah, you know it's. It, can you hear me? You hear me? Okay. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I mean, I like the idea, and I think you really don't have much choice with this far off, but focusing on creating a record because so many of the people are dead. And that's one reason for this restorative justice, for these truth and reconciliation commissions to create the record. I think we could use that in the U.S. in terms of the, uh, in terms of, of, of the race thing. That's an interesting that kind of restorative justice model. But you know, in, in response to what, what Kim said about the individual and the group, I think there's two sides to it because yes, there's a group, but people relate better to individuals. I mean, you look at this thing in the United States, I mean, what caused this focus on the race was that there were these very specific cases where there were individuals that people could focus on that something that offended people had happened. Everybody knew there was a pattern of, uh, of, of racism, but you know, it is an individual case. I know in Israel, they had the Eichmann trial and you know, everybody knew what Eichmann had done. Every, but there was something powerful about having these individual witnesses get up and say, you know, I was there and I, they actually had some guy who had met Eichmann in, in, uh, in Austria who had negotiated and said, yes, I recognize him. And, and there's something about, I mean, it's that Stalin quote, I, I, who knows if he really said it, but that, you know, that a, a single dead person is a tragedy and 50,000 is a statistic. You know, people relate to the individual case more than they do, you know, to, to the group. So there's that tension. I don't have an answer to that. 
there's that tension. Ideally, you would have, you know, it's like choosing your plaintiff, you know. Ideally, you would, it's like what Thurgood Marshall or Ruth Bader Ginsburg did. Ideally, you would have that individual case that stood for, you know, a whole class and that made an accurate representative point for the whole class. That's very, very difficult to do. But, but, but you, you, you have that tension that you want to deal with the whole group and yet people react to an individual more than they do to the, uh, to the overall group. Great, thank you. Um, Professor Nelson, are you still, uh, there you are. I'm here. Yes, I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to respond to Kim's comments about are we looking at, um, are we looking at how wars end maybe the wrong way with a, a sort of a, a too narrow lens and a too narrow focus on litigation? And I think from the research that I've done on sort of Holocaust property restitution across Europe, um, litigation is kind of your last resort. You have, you know, you look at the Paris peace treaties from 1945 and they all have these provisions that you're, you know, these countries are supposed to give their property back, you know, property that was stolen was supposed to return. And then you have these bilateral agreements between the U.S. and, you know, dozens of other countries in Europe that proper, you know, there's supposed to be these property rested, you know, you know, uh, Yugoslavia gives America seven million dollars, you know, in compensation for property that was taken from American citizens on Yugoslav territory. And then it's, the, you know, the, the job of the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission to sort of dole it out to the people based upon maybe, maybe less stringent criteria than in, um, in a court setting. But then, you know, 70 years later, we're kind of in the situation where we've tried all these other things and we're at our sort of last option and our last option is litigation. And if it fails, maybe we've, you know, garnered enough public attention that there will be some sort of public outrage and then there will be, you know, a greater recognition of, you know, the, the wrong that's occurred 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, and I think I would respond uh, the same way, Kim, to your question. Um, you know, are court cases the right way? Almost certainly not. Uh, but in the absence of political will or in the absence of any other, um, uh, any other solution, it's sort of the, it's the last resort as Professor Nelson was just saying. Um, you also asked this question about, you know, should wars end differently? And I, and I think, yeah, they should. Um, I think if we look at World War II, everyone loves, everyone loves Nuremberg and people maybe are a little bit more critical of the Tokyo tribunals, um, but there was almost no attempt to actually repair individual harm, right? Uh, and that's in part because the US actually excluded at the San Francisco Peace Treaty negotiations, actually excluded China, Taiwan, and Korea. So the countries actually most devastated by Japanese aggression didn't like literally didn't have a seat at the table. So I think if we, you know, A, need to include everybody who might who might have been uh, harmed by the war or at least their, their national representatives, um, and then, uh, you know, make an attempt at least to uh, address the harm that individuals suffered, right? Because again, criminal tribunals are great. They tell us who did what, but there's no attempt or no emphasis on, uh, on, uh, on curing the harm that many people have actually felt, uh, have actually suffered. And so it, it's not until 50, 60, 70 years later that civil litigation provides this um, imperfect, but, but again, probably only resort that, um, that such victims have. Um, and Margaret, just briefly to respond to your question, um, I think I've characterized it as rewriting history. I'm not sure comfort women themselves. I think uh, they are still motivated by uh, a desire for an apology um, that, that the Japanese government has not really issued. Um, and I think you know the compensation piece, the financial compensation piece is part of it, but I think uh, more is, is just the idea that they want some form of satisfaction, satisfaction in the sense of redress or remediation or acknowledgement that they were harmed, right? Rather than a couple thousand bucks or you know some sort of monetary symbol of that, they want um, the Japanese government to acknowledge that what they did to them was actually a, a grievous human rights abuse. So I've characterized it and I've maybe interpreted it as a way to smoke out denialism, uh, and that's maybe my you know Western postmodern take on it. But I think for the people actually involved, I think maybe the lawyers would also want to make sure the historical record is checked. But I think um, the victims themselves, you know, they want to have a voice, they want to get their story out there. Um, but I, I think uh, correcting the record might be less important than say uh, uh, you know actually getting an apology or getting some kind of uh, of satisfaction. In any event, um, this has been a, a great panel. I'm so grateful to uh, my three co-panelists. I'm grateful to the audience for sticking around till 7.45 on a Friday night.
Um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad for your participation and I look forward to having more conversations about this and other issues in the future. So uh, with that, I say thank you. Uh, I wish you all a good night and uh, good luck with the rest of the semester. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Rick.